All right. I think we are live. Super yeah. excited, super excited. Let me do a double check here just to make sure we are live. Make sure I can share this out on Zing LS's page. Yep, we are live. Hello, everybody. Make sure hey. you say hello as you come on in. Uh oh, we're here. Yep. We're I here. Hear, I hear the dings. I hear the dings. Yeah, we're here. Woohoo. So let me get it on Zing LS's page because that's where lots of people are going to be meeting us. Okay. I am super, super excited for those of you who have been eagerly awaiting part three. Yes, this is part three of our Matters of the Mind Tele Summit. If we recap really quickly, on Monday, we had Ashley Gilmore here with us. She talked about relationships. If you are in a relationship, you need to go and see that replay because she talked about what you actually need to do before, during, and after to make sure your relationship stays a relationship. So if you missed that, go back and watch the replay from Monday. On Wednesday, we had Dion Murphy and we had Nakisha Smith just talking about mental health talking about some OCD, how it relates to your life, um, how it doesn't always look like you think it looks. Um, so again, if you missed Wednesday, you got to go back and follow up with that. And tonight, we got the men bringing up the rear. Tonight, we have Anthony Tyre with uh -huh. us and Quay Weston. So as you come on in, make sure you are pressing that button. You share this out on your news feed. Make sure that people come on in the room, particularly your men in your lives, so that they will understand that mental health does relate to them. Lots of women typically view our broadcast, but tonight we have some men here with us, and we want to make sure that we get this information out to them. So just to follow up, this is Mental Health Awareness Month. That's May. And so Zing Life Services want to make sure that we did something to make sure we bring awareness to mental health. We know that it's not just in the month of May that we need to bring this awareness. It's actually every month, every day, every hour. But we wanted to do this telesummit just to bring some awareness, just to open the lines of communications and to start um, the conversation. So I typically see people in my professional realm for blood pressure, for diabetes. You're always concerned with how to not have a heart attack, how to not have a stroke. But very few people actually ask what it takes to keep their mind actually minding, what it takes to understand the matters of the mind. And so tonight we're going to be here just talking about how matters of the mind is so important, how it does affect all elements of your health, how it's impossible to get your blood pressure under control if you have uh, anxiety because one triggers the other. Um, and so how you have to make sure you are finding out what all areas are as it relates to your health. Now, I have to do a disclaimer here for my own health. Um, I have had a week of still trying to get back to my normal from my um, health, my health, and wellness perspective. So you'll see me lay back on this couch. I'm not reclining. I'm not just chilling out. I'm an active participant, but in an effort to make sure I remain compliant, I have to rest. Um, and I could not pass up this opportunity that I had already scheduled and said that we were going to do. So I'm that passionate about making sure that I get information out to the community. I'm that passionate about Zing Life Services. I am that passionate about helping you make sure you do what's right and what you know you need to do. So without further ado, I see people coming in. Make sure y'all are chatting it up in the comments. Hey, Ms. Vivian, thank y'all for tuning in. I am going to let Anthony be the first to introduce himself. Hello, everyone. Um... My name is Anthony. I am a uh, current nationally certified counselor. I hold an associate level license in North Carolina for both as a licensed professional counselor and a licensed clinical addiction specialist. I currently work in our rural areas with our underserved, underprivileged population, um, as well as with uh, families and children that 
are experiencing behavioral health issues um, as well as substance use disorders and things of that nature. I'm pretty active in, in the community. Um, I'm back home doing it, so that kind of helps out quite a bit, so. Where is home? Home for me is Aurora, North Carolina, down in Beaufort County. Yes, uh, yes, Beaufort County, and um, I, I, I also work well with uh, Martin, Terrell, Washington counties, um, more of our smaller areas to make sure the services get to people who wouldn't normally be able to get out of those areas to receive the services that they need. Nice, nice. So we know that rural North Carolina is um, unfortunately one of the areas that makes it so hard or difficult to get health care, not only mental health care, but also just health care in general is access to health, um, is transportation, financial issues. There's so many reasons why there are barriers to health care. Um, so I'm excited to hear that you have taken the task of helping to reduce some of the barriers as it relates to access and actually help um, the residents of those counties. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's that was part of my drive. So, you know, I initially started out, you know, in the military, I spent time doing corrections. Um, throughout my correctional career, I just felt like there was more needed. And um, just remembering where I came from and, and some of the challenges that I faced as well, moving forward and growing, um, I just felt that call to return and just try to provide some other type of resource for folks there. And, and of course, the biggest resource right now that I can say that I provide is not really the counseling part of it, it's the education part of everything. So this is the ideal opportunity to have that conversation. Uh, thank you, thank Zing Life, um, bringing me to the panel, bringing us both here to just kind of have that conversation and talk freely about it. So. Nice, nice. So let's jump right in because the meat of the conversation that I want to discuss is the elephant that typically is in the room, which is black men and their relationship or lack of relationship with mental health services and um, knowing the need for those services. Yes, yes. Um... You know, just just to kind of comment on that, you know, it's 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 funny. I was reading an article produced by the National Alliance on Mental Health on Mental Illness. I'm sorry, uh, NAMI, as we know it, N A M I and um, N A M I dot org. You know, and according to the Health and Human Services Office of Minority Health, African Americans are 20 percent more likely to experience serious mental problems mm -hmm. than the general population. Mm-hmm. That's a lot. That's a lot. That's a whole lot. So, um, you know, they they moved on to even give further breakdown to uh, to provide pretty much the top four of what the African-American population is currently struggling with. And that is major depression, ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, suicide, among young African American men yep. in post traumatic stress disorder, you know. Um, and then, of course, they went on to highlight some of the issues to consider, which I'm sure we will get into later on mm -hmm. when it comes to those numbers and what that really looks like, you know. So, that is actually um, an astounding number 20% more in the African American. Um, related to the general population. Mm -hmm. I will say, again, that points back probably without having read that same article, um, it, it points back some to just things in the African-American community in general. Yes. Um, and so this number, although we're talking about as relates to mental illness, um, it is not a number that's alone in terms of the rates of African Americans with high blood pressure, African Americans with heart attack, African Americans with diabetes and stroke. Um, right. and so I think globally, as a healthcare 
um, reform, if you will, for the African American community, we really have to figure out what is it that we need to do from the ground up to help improve numbers. Right. Um, and it can't just be me improving somebody's blood pressure because if you have PTSD, I, you know, I, I can only help you so much. We still have to target the other part of your health, which is going to include those mental parts too. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's, it's funny because, um, as you continue on in that same article, they didn't highlight only one quarter of African Americans seek mental health care. Mm -hmm. You know, and you know, just moving forward in in that realm of things, there's a host of reasons why, of course. Um, but like you said, I think you know one of the major approaches that I found works is that total wellness approach. You know, whereas in if you're going to work on blood pressure, well, then I may need to work with someone on handling their anxiety, you right. know, how to cope, work on those skills. Because if not, then by the time you check their blood pressure, it, it may stay off the charts. Who knows? You know. So I'm putting the question in the comment for our viewers um, so that we can get some interaction. What are some of the reasons you think? Black men don't seek, that should be seek mental health treatment. Um, and so, again, there are stereotypes that we hear. You see it all the time. You're married to a black man. You're in a relationship with one. They're your brothers. They're your uncles. They're your dads. Mm -hmm. And it's always the elephant in the room. We know that something is going on. And I'm not just singling out black men. Of course, women have similar issues. But because we are talking to men tonight, I am going to single you out a little bit. Um, but tell us why you think there are some reasons why people don't get the treatment that they need. So while you put those in the comments, we're going to flip over and let Quay introduce himself. Okay. Hey, everybody. Quay Weston right here. Um, <laughs> some folks call me King, but I am a multitude of things, primarily an artist. Um, educator, community organizer, all those things, I'm mostly creative as well. I'm from Pantego, North Carolina, also Beaufort County, so shout out to y'all. <laughs> um, I've done a, quite a few things, um, especially around my mental health journey, so I'm, I'm excited to share that. Um, so thank you for inviting me even to this platform to talk about that. Because y'all have named some of the things that I definitely was going to touch on. So I, I'll elaborate on those once I get to it. But that's a little bit. That's who I am. Nice, nice. And so as you can see, if you are just tuning in, I'm Nikeidra Brown. I'm the nurse practitioner with Zing Life Services. We are doing this Matters of the Mind Telesummit to get some of those issues out as it relates to mental health. And tonight we're talking about how it relates to Black men and their mental health status. And so I've asked the question in the comments, what are some reasons you think black men in particular don't seek the mental health treatment um, that they need? And so we talked a little bit from, or heard a little bit from our expert, who is Anthony here with us tonight. And now I'm gonna flip over to Quay, who just told us um, that he's had his own experience with some mental health changes now let me say this and i clarified mm -hmm. on wednesday so everybody has mental health mm -hmm. everybody has mental mm -hmm. health just like everybody has a blood pressure everybody has a heart rate we all have mental health however everybody is not mentally ill right Correct. Um, and there are certain things that bring about changes in mental health on wednesday it was a uh, female panel. So we talked about changes as it relates to hormones, right? Having a baby is the biggest thing that causes changes in your mental health, if ever I could think of. Um, and so your mental health can be changed or challenged by different things going on in your life. So mental health changes are a part of life. You know, people pass away, people are born, you lose a job, you get a job, you out of relationship, your heart is broken one day, you're in relationship the next day. All those bring about some mental changes. It's when those changes don't 
or become permanent that they flip over and become an actual illness. And the illness are the things that we need to make sure um, that we are targeting. The statistic I saw, and Anthony, you can correct me on this if you know another, that one in 25 um, will have a mental illness. Um, and so one in five adults actually have some degree of changes in their mental health status at some point or another, but one in 25 actually has a major mental illness, which are some of the ones that Anthony spoke about earlier, talking about PTSD, schizophrenia, major depression. Those things are what we call major. And so Quay, you look like a normal guy. I think, I, I think, I'm, I think I'm pretty normal. <laughs> right? if, norm, if there is a normal right exactly <laughs> you know you educated you just said you're from Pantigo you graduated high school you went to college you were reared in the church mm -hmm. you um, have a job you've done amazing things and so what's your story because certainly you somebody like you can't have struggled with your mental health hmm that's 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 real um and i think a lot of my journey has been uh, very introspective so i i do a lot of internal processing mm -hmm. and i think that comes from how we're socialized to think about feelings right mm -hmm. especially for black men it's like you don't cry mm -hmm. you want to be a man you want to be strong you want to be there for everybody you want to be serious and look like you're about your business you don't want to be too uh what's the word uh eccentric and flamboyant so you don't want to be too much of anything oh so i just want you to be this specific way to be a manly man right hmm. especially growing up in the south in the country folks you know there's things that the men do the women do is how it's perceived so especially growing up in the church right so right. a lot of my story was finding ways so okay started as a kid i was very creative very fun uh very joyful youthful joked a lot my aunts tell me really funny stories about me that i don't remember but <laughs> i'm up through high school you know i continue to grow and kind of see what manhood and, and masculinity is supposed to look like or how i'm supposed to interact be it through sports or girls or whatever the case might be so when i got to college that was more of a, okay, I'm just here. It's just me. Now I got to figure out who I really am. Mm -hmm. And again, I just went back to what I know that happens. So it's, it's dating is random hookups with random girls. If I meet them in the party, meet them in the club is drinking is, is smoking is all the things um, that would display that I was the type of guy that, that people would be interested in, mm -hmm. right? So you want to be mysterious. You don't want to be too emotional or too right. sensitive. You got to want to hold a little bit of that back. And when you get into engagements or discussions, you want to kind of stonewall or not say too much or not be expressive. But what I realized that was, was that I didn't know, I wasn't in touch with my emotions at all. Mm -hmm. I had literally wow. grown to detach myself from those. What are right? emotions? So if I'm what sad. Emotional, why, right? Yeah, like why do I need emotions for what? What has to happen is I'm a guy, I need to get things done. Right. That's my job, right? right? Yeah. Protect and provide, protect and provide. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't include sitting down and telling you, hey, I think I'm sad right now. That includes I'm sad, but I don't know how to process sadness. So now I'm just angry because so I feel like I might be sad. <laughs> right? Watch um, this. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And that's, and that's my, a lot of my story was realizing that I didn't have to be a particular way. And a lot of it was trial and error. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have a bunch of like homeboys I could talk to about what I was feeling in relation to, wow. let's say, dating a girl and actually wanting to be committed to her and like, oh, I, you know, this is my girl. So this is any like what you are you or what? What you said? Oh, man, you just get one girl. Oh, she exactly. got you free. Right. The world is yours. Do what you do. So you do, right. Yeah. It's like the support and and all of that that kind of emotional intelligence. I would say, largely comes from a lot of the women you're around. Mm -hmm. Right. So I can talk to my my homegirls like, hey, this is what I'm thinking about with this girl. Can you tell me like how I'm supposed to handle this situation? 
Mm -hmm. um, and, and a part of that being socialized to, you know, like I said, detach from emotions or not say that you need help with things because that symbolizes weakness in a way. Right. You should be able to do these things yourself. It kind of left me by myself. Right. Figure it out. And I was like, I don't need no friends. I'm good. <laughs> I'm out here. You know what I'm saying? I'm the man. I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm a man. I'm going to figure it out. I'm cool. Yep. Nothing bothers me. That's it. You can't bother me because I'm That's a man. It. Yeah. That is it. You think I'm wrong. you don't need other people. You just yep. said, I don't need any friends. I don't need nobody. I don't need yes, nobody. Sir. Yeah. Right. I'm grown. When I'm grown, I'm supposed to know it already. Exactly. I got to figure it out from here. Exactly. Yeah. So what that led to was a lot of suppression. Right. And the way that I think about it is for me personally, like suppressing all these things for so long, I ended up depressed because I would push people away if they got too close or if I had to be too vulnerable. So I was kind of lonely. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't talk to anybody about what I felt because I wasn't sure of what I felt. Mm -hmm. So that made me just stay in my head a lot, which made me anxious about everything. And then from there, I kind of had my friends groups, but nobody was too close. So they didn't really know me. So now I'm like, oh, I got friends. Man, we ain't really friends. Right. Right. So then you feel like you can't trust anybody. Nobody understands you. And that right. was just you again. Um, so that led to me getting into a really, um, people say dark place. I wouldn't say dark, but a very uh, unfortunate place to be in. Um, at that stage of life I was in. So I graduated college, did all the things I thought I was supposed to do. Like, this makes me a man. This is what I'm supposed to do. So I graduate. Um, and then I'm like, dang, what's next for me? Right. You know, what's the next step? How do I go and like make all this money? Because that's attached to being a man. Right. right? You got to, and don't nobody want no broke man. That's what I've always that's heard. <laughs> that's what I always heard. Right. You know? So I'm like, okay, I need to make me some money. And then I, I got to find a job that I love. And I'm like, these jobs don't pay that much. I probably need to do something different. <laughs> but it's also like processing that was difficult because who do I talk to? Right. Right. And um, I think that really, that is what led me to looking into therapy, looking into counseling, and just mm -hmm. having to figure out something different for myself mm -hmm. because that was not working. Right. Um. And then later in my story, kind of a few years ago, I decided to go to counseling, found me a counselor. That was a whole process. That was a long process, right. um, especially thinking about finding a black counselor that yeah. understands, that has yeah. cultural competency, that understands right. what you might be going through and what you might be dealing with. Right. Um, yeah. That was a process in itself. Um, so once I started going to counseling, she helped me create some, some skills and some, some, basically some tools that I could utilize when I start feeling low or when I start feeling like I might be depressed or when I'm too anxious. Right. Uh, and, and today I can say that I've, I've utilized many of those. Um, I'm better than I was for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's just an everyday practice at this point. Right. Right. You, and I think that's the key to everything you said is right there at the end, man. It's, it's an everyday practice, right? Like, People go and they get on diets, they go work out, they do all these things for their body, but their mind is just automatically supposed to be strong, you know? Right. And, you know, you just got to figure it out once you have an issue. But if your arm is hurting or if your body is hurting or if you're sick, you can only figure it out to a certain extent. Right. And then you have to go see someone else to get some type of guidance on what to do next, right? right. But for some reason, when it comes to behavioral health, mental health, mm -hmm. we just supposed to work it out, you know? Um, and a, a lot of the work that we do, myself and a lot of my colleagues, we spend a lot of time trying to break the stigma, you know? Um, when you were first contemplating about trying to find some other way, Mm -hmm. Did you talk to anybody else before you thought of, you know what, I need to find a counselor. I need to seek some type of therapy. You know, I did actually. Um, mental health has been something, or at least finding ways to deal with mental health issues has been something that my grandmother has dealt with. Right. So I knew that. So I called her and I said, hey, mm -hmm. grandma, I know, you know, this thing is going on. This is what I feel might be happening. Like, what would you say 
or what should I do in this case? So luckily I had her to reach out to. Right. Because as we, as we have said in the, in black community, often like you don't talk about depraved, you don't, you don't want to, what they say, you don't want to put that on yourself or you don't want right. to you know, claim something that might not be true. Right. And you right. also don't want to put the family business out in right. the street either. So I don't want to say, <laughs> right. So, you know, it's, it's luckily I had her honestly. Right. Um, and that was the person I reached out to, to know like, okay, I probably need to look into this a little yeah. bit more. Yeah. And for a lot of people, especially from, you know, I can speak from rural mm -hmm. areas in the South, you know, um, cause that's where I was raised. Right. A lot of those, those pieces of the puzzle that you had, a lot of us don't have. Exactly. You know, um, and it's unfortunate because a lot of the secrets, those are, that's a major barrier to once we get to a certain position in our lives and understanding more that we may be weak in a certain position, mm -hmm. we don't always have somebody to turn to. Because yep. if we turn to them, I don't know if you've ever heard this before, but go to church on Sunday and pray about it. True. Heard that. <laughs> you know, um, and I'll never forget it, man. One of my first conferences, one of the presenters, she told us, she said, I am a Baptist preacher and I can talk forever. She's like, but I'm also a counselor. I'm a therapist, a licensed therapist. She's like, the one thing I tell folk that come to me, yes, pray about it. Mm -hmm. Take my card, and as soon as you get up, call me. Yep. Because we got some more talking to do, awesome. <laughs> right? But that, that that's so rare from our our in and what it looks like in our community, right? Um, so, man, like, first of all, I thank you for telling your story, right? Because so many times that gets lost in the manhood of mm -hmm. who we supposed to be, right? You're not going to tell a story that's going to make you look weak. For what? Who's going to respect you on that, right? But then once you start to tell your story, you realize sometimes, like, you're not the only one going through it. That same person over there that was acting just as hard as you are, they're going through the same journey. Mm -hmm. And by you have, having that ability to finally reach that position where it's like, hey, I'm going through something. Next thing you know, somebody get like, man, Who'd you talk to? Yep. What'd you do? Man, I'm going through the same thing, right? And I think that helps us start to bridge that gap in seeking treatment, seeking help. Man, um, so you also spoke on finding a counselor. Mm, yes. <laughs> that, that, whew, that process. That process. Talk to, like, t huh. tell me what that process was like. Man. Okay, so it was long. Let me tell you that, first of all. <laughs> it, was, it, it was a challenge. Um, and, that, and it, you know, of course it has its reasons, right? When we think about black folks, black men especially, and doctors. Right. We don't, <laughs> you don't really trust the doctor. You don't want to get on medications, all those things. So, and just the general, like, way that, African Americans are typically misdiagnosed when it comes to medical relief. Right. Um, so my process was, I was I went through my work program. They have like a work life balance thing. I can't think of the name of the organization that they uh, they work with, but they would mm -hmm. give you like three free counseling sessions. And I'm like, okay, I'll try to start there. So uh, started there, found some names of counselors. And then I was like, wait, some of these people aren't in my network for my insurance. I can't go to them. <laughs> right. And it's like, okay, now I'm down to two black people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> then I'm like, okay, now I'm down to like, two, right. so I'm like, right. yeah. two black counselors. And then yeah. that's also a privilege of having insurance because a lot of people don't have insurance. That's so it makes right. it right. unaffordable. So have that, have two folks. And I'm like, okay, I got to pick one of these people yeah. because I only get three free sessions. And, it, and then it's going to a counselor, hoping that y'all connect, right. hoping that y'all can, that, that it's a good match. I hear that that's the thing. And maybe you can speak to that too. 
like what that matching process is like. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. you might not be able to do thing that that person needs. Exactly. Um, but luckily I found the right person. Yeah. That first time. Yeah. But so my initial it search. Was not luck. It, it was God. I think so. So I knew she was going to get you for that. Right. <laughs> so, um, but prior to going through my work uh, program, cause I didn't even know we had that. Um, and that's not something that they really mention in our like benefit stuff. You just yeah. got to kind of look for it. Mm -hmm. But before I spent about a month looking for counselors in my area that utilize my insurance, yeah. might've had some like Christian, uh, they covered like Christian counseling or that was like a focus of theirs. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it was down to the two people. Once I finally got into the funnel of using my, work program for the first few sessions and out of those two people got let me to the right one right. so it took yeah. about a month and a half to find someone that would be affordable and will also work with the the focuses that i needed that i felt like i needed at that time yeah and you know that's a very powerful piece man because uh again at the end of the day i try to let people know they have to take charge of their health mm -hmm. you know long gone is the day of you know, what that medical professional said is absolutely right, done, yep. right? You have to take some type of personal responsibility and what fits and matches you. And not just to hear what you want to hear, but mm -hmm. to kind of find that connection, right? The biggest thing about therapy, man, that I, I spend a lot of time also just kind of letting people know, the biggest point about therapy is we aren't problem solvers. We aren't here to tell you what you should do or what you can do next, right? Mm -hmm. The biggest thing is finding someone that is able to make you feel comfortable enough to start to share your story, mm -hmm. to start to let them into your life, right? Um, sometimes we do ask a lot of questions, a lot of poking and prying questions, but if it's done properly and it's done in, in the correct manner, it's not a poke and pride, it's just a conversation. Right. And sometimes for certain people, I don't call what we do a session. I don't call it therapy. I call it a conversation mm -hmm. because that's really what it boils down to. Right. I'm trying to learn you enough that I can understand or at least have some type of understanding of where you're coming from. Right. Mm -hmm. I should also be competent enough in in my work to know if you present something to me that's outside of my scope of practice, mm -hmm. I should be comfortable enough to let you know like, hey, Quay, I'm gonna be honest with you, I have no idea what you talk about. So with that, I can then let you know like, however, I would love to walk with you through this experience if you wanna bring me you know, through it with you. Mm -hmm. If not, I can refer you to someone who specializes and what you have brought to the table, right? Nice. And for so many people, they feel like, well, I had to go see a therapist today and I don't like them. Yeah. They didn't get me. They don't understand me, right? Two sides to that conversation for me. One is, that is perfectly okay. Mm -hmm. Go find you another one. Go let them know that, or just reach out to somebody else. Search, look, ask the questions, right? Let your primary care or whoever the referral source may be, let them know, like, I tried, see, <laughs> right? right. Yeah. I tried, it didn't work. Do you have anything else for me? Yep. Right? The other side to that that I found is a lot of people, and especially when they're kind of resistant to treatment, they say, well, you've never been where I've been. So you can't understand, yeah. me, right? Mm -hmm. And this is a little drastic, right? But I also tell them I've never been shot or died before, but I don't want to do either one of those two right now either, right? right. But with that being said, I don't have to go through everything to understand that it can hurt. Mm -hmm. So with that, again, my job and where I come in is I'm here, left seat, right seat. You want to bring me into it? Let me get a good understanding. I don't know everything. I'm not even trying to know everything. Yep. And I do have some um, folks that I work with now that I've had to tell them like, look, honestly, I have no idea what's going on. 
but what you said over here made sense but how does that all come together mm -hmm. just to learn more and build that rapport but also to get a true understanding of where you're coming from yeah. you know and and that's always a challenge for some people especially when they're first walking into trying to receive this treatment right um so yeah and i, this one, I have a question for Ms. Brown. <laughs> yeah, I think it's for you, Anthony. Uh -oh. so, so what what I realized also, and as you mentioned that, you know, counseling isn't going to like solve everything. It's not like, a, oh, I go to counsel once and now I'm fixed and everything's right. fine. <laughs> so um, like how is that, what my counselor did or my therapist did was help me to find in a really, I don't know how it happened, but help me find like the root of things. Absolutely. Right, and once I found that, I'm not able to recognize like, oh, this is why I feel this way about this particular thing. Right. And now that alters my perception or my feeling about it kind of mm -hmm. going forward because I understand where it's coming from, where it'd be mm -hmm. like a childhood issue or like a, something somebody said that stuck with me forever. Mm -hmm. Right. So I guess for you, how is that, how do you see that being like so impactful and so beneficial for folks when they see like where this issue stems from? So, you know, I have this thing where I think people use a lot of things to cope, right? Mm -hmm. Anger can be a coping piece to someone's life, right? Mm -hmm. Emotions can come about from someone trying to cope with what, whatever they're going through, right? Um, but coping with something doesn't always mean facing something. Mm -hmm. So at some point, if if that individual wants to explore that part and really get down to some of the root causes um and you'd be surprised like some of my strongest men that you could possibly think about some parts of treatment and therapy during the sessions they do break down mm -hmm. because you start to unlock these levels and these doors and they start to face what they've really been running from mm -hmm. Right. Um, one of the hardest things I think for, you know, some of our men is trying to figure out how to be men without being taught. Mm. And also trying to figure out how to be men without having the proper role model right. to go back to. Right. And for everyone listening, I'm not talking about, you know, I, I understand about the grandmothers and the uncles and the, and the fathers and moms and things like that are in that space at that time. Mm -hmm. But one thing that I feel should start to come about is teaching our young men how to prepare for what's coming. And by preparing, I mean, give them ways in people to come back to and talk to about anything. Mm -hmm. Mom and dad, sometimes those voices are like recordings in our head. Yep. Turn them off because we already know what they're going to say, right? But be able to learn from your experience, accept what's going on, and how can you move forward from it? How can you build on whatever just happened, right? Instead of trying to figure it out all on your own because we're going to make mistakes, yep. right? Um, so it's, it's, you know, there's so much that you brought forward that could be unpacked, right? Um, you know, I believe it was either you or Nakija that spoke toward the misdiagnosis of, of some of our folks in our culture, right? And what does that look like? Why, why is that that way? And is that part of the reason why so many of, of folks from our culture refuse to go seek treatment? Mm -hmm. You know, um, what are you thinking about that, Ms. Brown? So I have a list of things because y'all can get me out of the <laughs> uh -oh. conversation, but I've been patiently waiting. Yes, I've been patiently waiting. Um, but in response um, to your last question, so. I see things primarily from the healthcare side. 
Um, and, and so I was going to say that a lot of times there are, or I have had interaction in particular with young um, Black men. And so I will say this also, Quay used the terminology culturally competent care. I'm so impressed. So impressed, by the way. Well, I can. <laughs> yes. Um, because what we know that to be are providers who look like us, who have some idea of our culture. Uh, you know, oftentimes I sit in groups where they try to plan things for the minority or black community. And I look at them like, don't y'all know we eat Sunday dinner? Like, right. <laughs> doing that on Sunday at one o'clock, won't nobody be there, you know? Right. <laughs> um, so part of having culturally competent care is to have providers who not only look like you, but have some idea of the culture and the dynamics of um, what goes on in your community. So for me, it was important at least to stop my, start my career and for Anthony now to go back and immerse myself in that culture and that environment that I already knew um, and to be bring about change into that community. And so when I see people who come they come to me for culturally competent care. You know, they come because they're looking for a provider who looks like them. Yes, I'm a female, and I will say I see far more black women than men because sometimes the men are intimidated by a female black provider. I will say that. That's a topic for another conversation. Um, but the ones who do see me, I feel like they have a lot that life has to offer them. Mm. So I have to now say to both of you, because you are being so impactful in your community and your environment, that we need more people like you. We need more people to reach back and to say, you know what? We know you may not have been around this growing up, but you know this is how we should start trying to change culture and do things. I can talk about it all day, but mm. Anthony, I think you said it, you know, I'm not a man. Just mm. like when people said, you've never been there. I've never been a man. I'm not going to be one. Right. And so there are things that go on with the dynamics of men in particular that a mm. female is never going to understand. I'm never mm. going to understand things as it relates to black men and in particular, just things that they go through as it relates to racism, as it relates mm. to sexism, as it relates to going down the highway, uh, you know, mm. having to worry about getting stopped and pulled over, all the dynamics of what it is in being a black man that brings about some things like PTSD. When, mm -hmm. Once you have a trauma and you're trying to move past that. I had a patient not long ago, very young, who and this happens quite often. Something happens, they get taken to the ER, they get a drug screen, of course their drug screen is dirty. And so right off the bat, the first sentence I read is either intoxicated or under the influence. Mm -hmm. I, anybody can be under the influence. I mean, what, what, what does that represent? And at that point, I feel like if it is a black man, the treatment of care either stops because they are under the influence or it drastically declines because that is the reason behind everything because they are under the influence. Right. Others would be treated differently is my opinion um, and typically are treated differently. Mm -hmm. This patient in particular actually went to a facility where he accounts that he was treated unfairly. He was treated harshly and he now has some traumatic recounts of just that whole experience so wow. he want to ever reach out to behavioral health and to get his mental illness under control is far beyond what he is willing to go now because he doesn't trust the health care right. you know right. he doesn't yeah. trust that. right um and so that's layer upon layer of things that you'll see just in dealing with mental health, behavioral health, um, 
in the community. I think these are issues that, of course, people would never understand if they don't right. live and experience it. Um, right. and that's why this conversation is one that I think people very much need to hear because not only does it affect people that you know, but it affects mm -hmm. the way people interact with you in your workplace, mm -hmm. interact with you in the store. Right. You know, interactions that take place on a day-to-day -day basis are most of the time guided by what somebody is thinking or right. how you make them feel or yeah. what is it that you said to them that triggered this thought of way back when when somebody else said that right. and they were in yeah. such a such place. Um, so there are a lot of triggers that go on, too. Um, to, to your point to PTSD, um, so I had make to learn plain. about make it plain. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. So I had to learn about PTSD from different levels, right? So many people know that I'm a veteran. I served 18 and a half years. Mm -hmm. I was medically retired in 2014, right? And it, it wasn't a choice of my own because I had a great career, right? And I was still pushing forward to move on, right? Move on meaning continue my career in the military for some time. So um, when I used to hear PTSD, I used to think, no, that's for military people oh, who've been in the war and were fighting and doing all of this. This is not for the civilian. This is ours. This is our diagnosis, right? Mm -hmm. Once I got into my coursework and I really started divulging deeper into some of the issues that, that I felt like I was, I planned on addressing when I finished, it made perfect sense. It's, it's not one solid brushstroke yep. of what PTSD can be or what it can look like. Mm -hmm. And just me coming from the same location in these same areas that, that suffer the same pains back then as they do now. At first. So I can just imagine folks who have not already been through some type of training or some type of, of, of understanding phase of what that can look like. So what I tell people quite often is, as a vet, I get it. PTSD can come in many shapes and forms, right? But as a, as a black man, PTSD can also come in many shapes and forms. And each culture, each culture is free to have their own understanding of what that may look like. That's fine. I'm not going against that. I can only speak from my culture and where I've been. So when you have people who are able to witness violent crimes, they may grow up in certain areas and see certain things and normalize yeah. parts of their lives that in any other place, it would not be normal yeah. by any standard, right? right? But then they're blamed, they're blamed for that. You're, you're blamed for your surroundings not being normal. You're blamed for the situation you're in, but you're eight, you're nine, you're 10 years old. Mm -hmm. So the understanding is I come from a bad area. I come from a bad neighborhood. But there's no understanding of why I can't grasp things the way that you do. Yep. So I think that's, that's a gap that, that is present that I think it's our responsibility to help, to help fill it. Not fill it because we can't be the martyr but to bring understanding and awareness to what's going on. Um, also to, yes. So I was having this conversation uh, with somebody on yesterday or maybe the day before um, because it goes back to just what you said. And I'm, I'm so glad that all of us kind of that are on this panel have the same beginnings, if you will, in terms of knowing where we come from and yeah. knowing actually 
<clears throat> where it is, but what what is it that makes some people have a desire to make it and others just don't? You know, coming from that same background, coming from the point of knowing that there are transportation issues, there's lack of um, fresh and uh, food, pharmacies, healthcare in the areas in which we grew up. What mm -hmm. is it that moves some people past those points of, in their mind, past the point of, I've got to do more, and others don't? Mm -hmm. If you understand what I'm saying. Yeah, I do. Yeah. I think I get it. I'll, I'll shoot my, my, my take on it. Um, I think, especially growing up with the people I grew up with and the folks I grew up with, there's a, there's already a particular mindset around what it means to make it out and do things. Right. So there's already a perception of, of what that means. And there's, and there's people who, also feel and i just think about school and how that whole situation was like how tense it was between races how we huh. we would have white folks and black folks with the same last names and they would make jokes about how they knew that their family like owned our people right so it's it's and this and this is what i remember vividly so when you think about young boys and how they're like often undereducated and the literacy rate for young boys is so low, which connects to your job opportunities, which connects to your outcomes, which connects to what they call the school to prison pipeline. So like a lot of people just internalize that, I think. And it's not that they don't want to quote unquote, make it out or achieve or do these things. I think a lot of it is just the, what they're normalizing is like, okay, this is what life looks like for me in this area. This is what most people are doing. And this is what is, is putting me in a place where I'm getting respect and I'm getting social capital or like people see me as important if I <laughs> stay here. Right. And then some people's like, I gotta get out of here. Like I gotta try something different. So right. I don't, I don't think it's, you know, any direct fault of their own. I think it's a little bit of like internalizing issues and also not knowing what's available for them. Right. Um, so, so I'm gonna put you on the spot, Quay, before you answer, Anthony. And so I'm mm -hmm. gonna ask you, what are you doing to make yourself the new normal? What are you doing to impact or be that person that Ooh. the current <laughs> teenagers and young men see and say, you know what? I I want to be like him. I love to. Um, I think it's telling the story essentially, and not being ashamed that I have dealt with depression or dealt with anxiety, and still am dealing dealing with it from time to time, right. right? And it's like this is my regular self, and the more I don't tell you, the more you're just going to assume that there's nobody out here that relates to you. Right. So. Mm -hmm. I talking to people. I went back to my middle school slash elementary school and talked to the students there about just some of the things I'm involved in. Anytime I want to plan programs or there's hurricanes or floods, I reach out to the mayor back home like, hey, what can I do and who can I bring to make some things happen? Mm -hmm. It's like being visible still and also connecting with those people in those places and not saying, oh, this is my journey and now I'm just going to tell all these new people I, I've never met, but it's like making people realize, Hey, I'm here with you. I'm from the same place. We do the same things. I support you. And even if this is your journey, like talk to me, I'm open about it. And that's, that's kind of the best way. Mm -hmm. Just creating platforms for people to tell their stories as well. And hoping that something I say connects to them in a way and inspires them to get the help that they need. Even. Perfect. So, in the comments, I have put a link that Quay has supplied us with mm -hmm. um, that will have some Zing resources there as it relates to behavioral health, mental health, 
Um, and so it's at callmecain.com slash zing. That's and it. So you'll see that link in the comments if you're on any watch parties. Let's go into those watch parties and put that link. Um, so we want to make sure that people get uh, those resources. I'm going to drop a couple other link of resources. So there should not be any reason why you leave this broadcast without something. All the more reason for you to share it out because you never know who is suffering, who needs this information, who needs to figure out a link, um, who needs to know where to start. Like a lot of people, Quay talked about his job offered um, a program and he didn't even know it. A uh, lots of jobs do offer that. It's not something that they advertise, quote unquote, because most people are so obsessed with knowing what health insurance they have, how much sick leave and time off they have. Um, so you should be asking, what is it that you do for circumstances? How can you take care of my mental health along with my physical health? Lots of places, it typically is three free um, sessions. So you have to take advantage of those people who are in your network. For those of you who don't know what network means, who accepts your insurance and who will be able to see you under your coverage. So all that Quay talked about a few minutes ago, but I wanted to make sure I reached back in and talked about that. Um, because that is offered if you are covered under insurance. You should ask about coverage for um, your behavior health. Typically now, it is embedded in that plan, but it still is a thing that most people don't talk about. So unless you bring it up, they're just not going to say, hey, do you know you could actually get this help? Um, so make sure that you are asking the appropriate questions and getting what's due to you as it relates to your um, your insurance and your benefits. Okay, Anthony. Also, uh, a lot of college students, they don't understand or know that they can use behavioral health services that are actually on their college campuses. Yep, for sure. I have quite a few colleagues that work with some of the local colleges in the Wake County area, Durham County area, and you'd be surprised at the number of students that have no idea that they can go in and receive services um but um you know there there's so many different avenues of this conversation um you know about, and and i'll say for me like one of the things that allows me i think that allows me the opportunity to talk and to get through to certain individuals in my community is I'm just authentically me, right? Um, there's a whole story to how I came about to get into this seat. But at the end of the day, man, I'm just authentically me. When I first talk to anybody, the first thing I think about is what I felt like when I was in that position. When I was a 13 year old kid and every adult was telling me what I needed to do and how I needed to do it, nobody listened to what I wanted to do or how I wanted to do anything because I didn't know any better, right? But yet it never left my desire to do it. So I ended up doing it, right? Um, I didn't get on this, this train until later because in my mind, I wouldn't say it was the easiest way, but more people understood me on another side. So whereas in I'm supposed to be a certain way and present a certain way to this demographic of people, it just stressed me out. So it was easier to go with this side and this lane of folks who didn't ask me a bunch of questions. I didn't have to act a certain way. I could just be myself, right? And, and, and that kind of allowed me to sweat, right? I was smart in school. I didn't apply myself. And quite a few folks that went to school with me know that I just didn't apply myself. It's not because I couldn't, but there came a certain point to like, I could not understand why I didn't have a voice. I couldn't say what I wanted to say. I, could, I wasn't allowed to feel like I wanted to feel, you know? Um, and I think the one thing about our generation that's coming back and giving back is we're able to break a lot of the mold that was there. Um, 
one of the biggest things I point out as well, because I do work with a lot of our elderly population from Aurora, is they did the best they could do with what they had. Right. Absolutely. They, they strive, they push. A lot of them work three, four jobs at a time. They did the best they could do with what they had, but they had to allow us to come in and help change things from the way they were. And what I point to is this. When their parents taught them, and I'm talking about our great grandparents, mm -hmm. they had no idea that we could be in three different locations and talking to each other by sight at the same time. Wow. They had no idea these things were gonna happen. They had no idea that I could take five hours out of my day and I can probably catch a plane and go to many states and come back home by nightfall. They had no idea those things were gonna be possible. Wow. And then they definitely didn't have an idea that we, as young African Americans, would be able to do it. It just didn't make sense to them. Mm -hmm. You know, you can get up in the morning, take a flight to California, spend a day out there and come back tomorrow night and be back by Sunday for church. They never had any idea. So they could only teach us from a certain position. That's right, that's right. So we don't have to lose the core values of what they taught us, honesty, respect, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but we have to be able to grow upon those things. Cause if we don't, we're only gonna get caught in the same process of what we always do and what we have always done. And I think that's where, that's where a lot of the issues are coming about because we do have a lot of grandparents that are still trying to, to help and raise their That's true. grandkids. That's true. And they're doing the best that they can do, but they're facing things that they never thought they were gonna face. Right. This device right here, I came from an era where I could pick up the phone and dial the last four numbers, mm -hmm. but the phone was connected to the wall. <laughs> So I couldn't go but so far. Right. <laughs> now we have to understand, like, if you tell me something, I'll, I'll just go to my room, go up here and check it out. And if you're wrong, you've lost trust in me, mom. You lost trust in, I've lost trust in you, gr grandma. Uh, nah, unk, that don't make sense, unk. Uh-uh. <laughs> you know, so with that, they have to be able and willing to allow others to come in and assist them with the process. Mm -hmm. So true, so okay. true. Um, I think a lot can be said about communities in general and just how communities um, can either make or break lots of things as it relates to behavior and um, one's physical health. I mean, imagine me trying to break the routine of seasoning everything on your kitchen table with pork and making sure your blood pressure gets better, right? Um, so a lot of things go back to the community. Um, a lot of things we do have to bring those new ways of um, doing things to the people who still exist. And I would admit, yes, they were doing the best they could with what they had at the time. And I appreciate it. Um, yeah. I appreciate all I of what they did was what they had at the time um, because it's what made me, right. you know, who I am. And so I am certainly grateful. Let's see, I had a couple other things here that I wanted to touch on before. I'm not going to take up your whole night, so. Okay. <laughs> Quite like, okay, I got to go to work in the morning. No, 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 it's Friday. I ain't got no work in the morning. Uh oh <laughs> You know, um, while you're searching for that, Quay, okay. you made a good point, too, about insurances, right? And, you know, I don't know if we want to get into that now, but insurances and misdiagnoses and, Ooh. And, you know, our whole socioeconomic factors that kind of tie into why some of us don't receive the treatment we need and deserve. Um, mm -hmm. 
you know, because if I don't have insurance, like I ain't gonna go and pay that bill. Like that, that doesn't even make sense. And then next thing you know, they don't even reach out. Or some providers don't even let them know that there are agencies that accept you with no insurance. Mm-hmm. You know, or um, sometimes to get paid, I have to give you a diagnosis. Even if you don't always deserve one, it may not be the right thing to do, but sometime a provider might slap you with a diagnosis because that's the only way that I'm going to be able to get paid. You do fit the criteria for most of this, a lot of this, and I can see you going into that. So then what happens to our youth is sometimes that diagnosis rides them throughout. One thing for me is, 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 is challenging a lot of people that I see, they come with a previous diagnosis anyway. Mm. I spend more time educating them about their diagnosis than, than, than even getting into why they receive the diagnosis. Mm. Because for some people, once they receive it, they start fitting into that diagnosis. Yep. Mm. You know, like, man, well, the, it's like the doctor said, my, my arm is breaking out, so I got X, Y, Z. Right. Well, no, you, you, you don't, you got bit by some mosquitoes. Right. Um, but I get a lot of that when it comes to, uh, um, our youth, our youth cultural competence is a major piece when our young, and I'm talking about our eight, nine, 10 year old children are sitting in front of a clinician who may not be competent on where this child is coming from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I can take my list and I can check off everything this child is presenting with and you fit into this diagnosis. Right. I'll get the context of it later if I ever get the context of why you're acting out or why you're choosing to do these things. Yeah. And, th- and again, next thing you know, this, this child has now, this diagnosis is following them yep. throughout their teenage years. And sometimes every time they go in front of a provider, they remind them of what their diagnosis was mm. and what all of that entails. So only because I know you, Anthony, and, you know, you alluded to it already, this list that you're talking about, you know, you can imagine how this list can follow one throughout the lifetime of their education and, you know, into their adulthood. Because let's talk about that list with you, right? Mm -hmm. I know you from childhood. And if I think about some of the items on that list, like, you would have fit that list, right? <laughs> Everything. <laughs> you know? You would have fit the Everything. list. Would it to be continued on the bottom, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know? Um, and, and that's why in some spaces I can speak so passionately about it because, you know, a, a lot of things I speak about, I, I actually know about, you mm-hmm. know? Um, one of the things I tell a lot of people is, I didn't go to school to learn how to deal with other people. I went to school to to understand better what was going on with me and where I was coming from. Because I've always been able to to lead folks and kind of have this own space that I wanted, but it wasn't the healthiest. Like you said, Quay, you you end up just keeping every internalizing everything. Um, pressure, we all know the term. It busts pipes, it pops balloons, it does. It, pressure's not good. Period. Right. But while you're trying to figure everything out, and you're still trying to be a stand-up man like you think you're supposed to be, right? And then something we haven't even touched is the pressures of. Um, having our women already expecting us to be in a certain position mm-hmm. while we still trying to figure life out ourselves. Mm-hmm. Very true. You know, no, I don't have a, a, a 
bins or this or that. No, I don't have clothes for every single day of the week. Sometimes I have to wash in between and wear <laughs> it in. Um, but yes, I, I really am interested in you. You know, yes, I, I really do want to, to get to know you. Mm -hmm. Oh, but you want that instead. So how do I get that so I can get you? Yeah. What do I have to do to get you? That's good. Going to school is getting it. <laughs> so what do I have to do next, right? So, and we, we haven't even touched in that zone at all, right? You're going to have to do um, a part four on that, probably. Right. <laughs> um, because for our women, we need you. We, we need some level of understanding. Mm -hmm. We need some level of awareness. We need you guys some level of support, not giving, giving in to us and everything that we want, but we need that support and that, that, that space to be able to say, hey, yes, I am a man. Yes, I know I'm supposed to be doing these things. Yes, I'm actively working towards them. Mm -hmm. um, what's your thoughts on that, Quay? <laughs> thought, thought, thought. Thought, 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 right over there, right? Zing, yep. <laughs> I mean, simply put, simply put, that's correct. Um, it, it's it's a whole thing, you know. It's a part of a part of the process of of getting where you need to be. And I think a part of it is like dating. And what I realized in college was I wasn't I wasn't dating for the right reason, first of all. And then. By the time I was ready to seriously date somebody, I was like, dang, she's like emotional. I don't even know how to respond. Like she crying. And I'm like, oh, wait, what do I do? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it's, you have it happen to, you're absolutely right though in the support piece, like building that emotional intelligence is, is a mm. large part of what I'm learning still even. Yeah. And, and I think everything you said is correct. And, and it does put pressure, as you mentioned too, be a certain way to get a certain thing but then once you get it is also understanding like how to adhere to it that's a, that's that's a lot yeah that's a part for a conversation <laughs> i see where uh somebody put they don't think most men are willing to admit their vulnerability and need for emotional growth that's true well that's true to me i would challenge that a little bit admitting and not knowing Right. So if I don't know what being vulnerable means, or what that looks like. True. You know, to me, being vulnerable means like I'm scared of something. I'm scared of you. I ain't scared of you. I'm grown. Right. I'm a man. Right. Emotional growth, like emotional. Like, right. you, <laughs> right. like you pointed to earlier, emotions. I'm a man. We don't get emotional. I might go cry in a car, but you'll never know. <laughs> right. Right. So, <laughs> so me expressing that to to a young lady. How? Because I don't know how you're going to see me now. That's real. Uh Oh, I dealt with China. You look like I was a problem. And uh huh. So that's another way of hoping. I'm going to spin it. I'm going to always spin it. I don't understand what's going on with me. So I got to get this heat off me. And it's your fault. It's your fault. And I'm responding to a comment here that says that most men that they dealt with have tried to make it look like they were the problem. So again, it's just educating and trying to get a true understanding of who we are. Yeah. And when you give us your feedback and you're like, you need to be doing this, this and that, we don't know how to respond to that. It's like, well, you, I'm, I'm gonna find an excuse or a reason to, it's not gonna be me un, until I mature to the point that I can understand, oh, it's okay to be wrong. It's okay to have a bad day. It's okay to, to if I wanna cry about something mm -hmm. and it's just overwhelming, I can drop a tear. That doesn't make me any less um, of a man, it, it doesn't make me vulnerable to anything. It's actually helping me get these things out of me before I explode in a way that's sometimes unhealthy. 
Yeah. Uh oh, there's there's more to the conversation. Yeah, we uh -oh. we might. <laughs> got a lot. Y'all done opened up something. Now I'm gonna have uh -oh. to say. Yeah, we'll go ahead, Nikki. Hear that. Um, it also bears some weight to the females to understand their level of expectation, especially if you both are just getting out of college, you mm -hmm. both just starting out life. What makes you think that the pressure you put on a man to get married, drive the best car, get you this two and three carat ring because your friend has one and forbid you just have half carat, forbid that, you know, um, those pressures on particularly a man who is, and let's face it, women typically find themselves a little bit quicker than men anyway in terms of development in terms right. of life i see you anthony you know it's true yeah it's a short reason for that um and so those are extreme pressures and if you put that on the fact that you're trying to find a job you're trying to figure out just your space in the world that can be an extreme amount of pressures and so we do see an increase in some the behavior and developmental changes. I think it is around that pivotal 18, between 18 and 21, mm -hmm. um, which is not coincidental when high school, when mm -hmm. you graduate from high school and college. And mm -hmm. it probably is due some to the pressures of life. I mean, yep. I, I dated the same person, high school, college, and then thankfully, was willing to understand that we both were not in the same place emotionally mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at that time. And so we decided we would part ways. It took mm -hmm. us 10 years to figure it out, right? Mm -hmm. 10 years to figure out, you know, life, maturity. I'm doing this thing, you're doing that thing. And we've been married now for seven. Mm -hmm. um, but Sometimes you think it happens overnight. There's some work that took place in that 10 years. You know, we yeah, saw yeah, other people. Some ups and downs. Right. Saw other people, did other things, enjoyed life. Um, but there's some work that took place with us as individuals yep. over the course of that 10 years so that when we came back together, we are much better together now that yep. we've done that work over the course of 10 years than we are apart. And so people aren't willing to put in some of that full work to make it work during and beyond. Um, and to that point, it, it kind of ties into what our uh, attendee is saying now. Um, if, if they make a point of saying, you know, like, just being nice about it. And their quote is, uh, baby, you have, have you considered that you might be depressed? Close quote, right? But again, this goes back to the thing about you have to learn yourself before you can do anything else with anyone else, right? Mm -hmm. And you have to be able to love yourself. You can tell me everything wrong with me right now. You right. sound like a broken record because I'm going to fight it. I'm going to push it. I'm going to push back and some of the stuff you're saying, I don't even know what that means. I might be depressed. What are you talking about? I'm not depressed, I'm fine. Because the symptoms of depression, some people think those symptoms are just knock down, drag out, just, 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 just in the worst way that you can see it, right? Um, always crying, always having an issue with something. So you start thinking of like, I can't be depressed. You don't even know what those meanings are, right? So until, that person is able to find themselves and love themselves and love themselves meaning know themselves sometimes you may have to step away from that person and allow them that room to grow mm -hmm. um and in the meantime though we can always work on ourselves we work on ourselves yeah exactly right so but sometimes that that take this to go this way and you have to understand who you are. Yep. And once you do that, hopefully you can come around and complete that heart that, that y'all have done, right? And 
and bring it back together. If not, then guess what? It, it honestly, and it may sound cliche, it just was not meant to be. And sometimes people are so dead set on changing you mm-hmm. now that they forget yeah. you are still a separate person from who I am. Yep. I can see mm-hmm. you being the best or the worst in the world. It does not matter if you don't see it. Very true. I mean, y'all, y'all covered it all. Uh oh. Uh oh. Yeah, I think I think everything else is right. It's just that women are prepared. It feels like, or seems like, women are prepared to do all the internal work from youth to grown, and we are validated by like external things. So we never look inside to see what's wrong or what's going on because all of our value is found in the things we can collect and the things that we can like attach to ourselves. Mm-hmm. So until you get over that and realize that's not where you're supposed to be, then nothing changes. Right. Yep. And sometimes pe- people take failing at a relationship as failing, period. Mm-hmm. But that's just another part of learning who you are. Being able to step away from something that may be unhealthy for you really shows the maturity in you. Yep. You know, and sometimes it may take that to get that person to really look at themselves to say, wait a minute. Yeah, I'm glad she left. I'm glad he, he left. Or, wait, no, that's, that's not what I want. But I see what they were saying. Maybe I need some time away to get this going or make this happen. But um, I, I think forcing that peace is, does more harm than good. Mm-hmm. All right, y'all. So I know it's good. I know it is a good conversation, but you know what they say. All good things must come to an end. Wrap it up. <laughs> <laughs> um, I allotted about an hour for this, so I want to be mindful of our participants' time. But if you haven't already, make sure you share this out. This has been an amazing conversation. Um, For those of you who tuned in, if you're watching the replay, make sure you hashtag replay so we can say hello. Um, We're going to go through it. I'm going to let the panelists introduce themselves one more time, just in case you didn't hear their introductions. I am Nikeidra Brown. I am the nurse practitioner with Zing Life Services. We teach and train you on ways to get and stay healthy. We are doing this Matters of the Mind Telesummit because we believe not only your body needs to be in good health, but also your mind. And Anthony can reintroduce himself. I am Anthony. Uh, I'm a licensed professional counselor, uh, associate, and a licensed clinical addiction specialist, uh, both associate level licensed here in North Carolina. I work with underprivileged, underserved families and youth. I uh, also work with um, everyday families and in, in, in individuals as as well as youth. Um, I am the director of Eastern Community Care Foundation um, and I provide services to those that need point blank and I enjoy the conversation. So I am putting the websites for Eastern Community Care Foundation in the comments. You can most likely link up with Anthony there or you can see him tagged in um, the broadcast so you can catch up with him if you have specific questions is there any an email you want to give or anything else to get up with you anthony sure it's uh, a dot my last name t-y-r-e at e-c-c-f-n-c dot org feel free to send me a line send me a message um if you reference this video um hopefully we'll get enough that we can actually bring it back and we can keep the conversation going. Uh, I think this was a great start, a great opening, and I really am looking forward to possibly doing this again. All right. My pleasure. And Quay? For sure. Quay Weston, or can some people call me. Uh, I am a educator, artist, tech advocate, creative all around. I do a little bit of design and development here and there. Lots of community work, youth work, uh, community organizing. And I would say it's best uh, to follow me on any social media at Call Me Kane. 
C-A-L-L-M-E-K-A-I-N or visit callmecain.com. I'm always available to talk, to connect. I love sharing stories. Uh, I have a podcast. We'll talk about that in other moments when you reach out. But this is what I do, just creating communities. And thank you for making this happen, Akidra. So really quickly, I'm going to put the link for your resource. Can you tell them what they can expect if they download that? Callmecain.com slash zing. That's zing. So those resources, uh, those are snapshots, mainly PDFs about African-American health. Um, those are through a program my fraternity offers called Brother, You're On My Mind with Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated. Uh, some really great resources just to get information. Also understanding how mental health works for how it shows up in older men as well as younger men. Uh, just so you can see what some of those tips are as you hopefully process those new things. So that's what you can expect. And I'm not going to let you get off without saying two things. One, for those of you all who saw my book cover, I don't have one with me. I can't believe it. But for those of you who saw my book cover, um, be it the ebook or actually got a physical copy, I am so appreciative for everybody who is still supporting. But Quay actually <laughs> signed the book cover. For sure. That is ah, me. That was yeah. him. It's coming full circle. Absolutely. And thanks again for having me. So yeah, design, book covers, the banners for this event, any badges, those sorts of cool things. To and then how can they follow you on your podcast? So the podcast is All Things Eat, E-A-T. So All Things Education, Art, Technology. Um, there's a Facebook page, facebook.com slash all things eat, as well as Instagram and anchor dot fm slash all things eat so the facebook page is probably the simplest way what is it again i'm sorry it is facebook.com slash all things eat eat that is it that mean i need two signatures for my book for sure you do yeah how about that i need Follow two signatures for my book. <laughs> yeah all right, so I am putting these resources in the comments. Make sure you share out the original video so people can get the comments with the resources as well. Um, because our ultimate goal, I think all three of us, is to make sure that people get connected. So mm -hmm. right. that is our ultimate goal. And of course, you all know how to get up with me, either Nikedra Brown or Zing Life Services. So we can make sure we keep you all on the path to wellness. All right. So we have a, the panelists are going to meet me in the Zing, in the Zing, in the Zoom room. So that is the benefit of the people who register. So we are going to hop off of Facebook. For those of you who are on Facebook, we're going to bid you good night. And we're going to hop over to our Zoom room, see who is there, engage with our participants. So until next time, everybody, thank you so much. Good night. Good night.